Welcome, Diane. Good morning, Deb. Uh, we are doing a part two of a conversation that we had the other day. Um, it was not a formal interview and we had a lot of response. Um, it was a couple of days, um, or it may have been the day that Leslie Van Houten had been released um, on parole and actually released uh, from prison, which had not happened to uh, anyone from the original trial before. So you were barraged with a lot of media requests and we decided to do a video um, but even though we've been interviewed before, um, you know, we know each other really well. And so it was kind of more of a conversation and the response was great, but I think people really want to hear, um, more of your story, things that, uh, we may take a little bit for granted, um, you know, because we're close to the story. We wrote the book together and have gotten to know each other. Um, so I appreciate that you are willing to do another actual interview with me. Um, again, I'm Deborah Herman, and I hope that people will subscribe to um, this page because we plan to do more interviews. Um, so thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. I, I really appreciate all the the positive response that we got. I was really surprised by how many people um, tuned in. Well, I think there's still a very strong interest. Um, this event, in a way, just opened everything up again. Uh, I mean, there's been ongoing interest in your story, in the book, in in Manson. But, you know, how, let's start off with what did this do for you having everything back in the news? Oh, it, it, it's been difficult really because it's like ripping the bandaid off or the, the scab off of this um, wound that uh, happened a long time ago, but it's, you know, because the story is still uh, moving forward or moving on and in all its depths, it really um, kind of threw me, really. Yeah, it was very, as, as people can see from the first video uh, that we did, it's very emotional. I was actually choking up, you know, I read a portion of the book um, that, you know, we've, it was a while ago. I mean, we've been interviewed since then, but the book, we, we wrote it several years ago and hadn't, I don't think you had read it again in such depth. And so I was very touched by your natural, um, I mean, I was sad. I was sad for you. You know, I really saw how how much it impacted you. I I was really surprised as well because I had not, you know, I remembered the, um, like I said before, I remembered the overall, my overall response to what they told me. And that was that how gleeful they were. But as far as the details, I hadn't really reread in its entirety, but it really brought it back. It's like, yes, I remember. I remembered what they told me vividly and from the rereading. And it just really uh, surprised me how sad it made me feel. Even even now, just thinking about it, it makes me, it, it kind of tears up my stomach in in remembering how I felt that these people that I loved you know, that had been my family, they had been my sisters. And I, you know, I wasn't necessarily in love with all of them. But no, they, I, I was, just like in a family. It's a family. And that these people that I loved could have done such a brutal, been involved in such a brutal act, just blew my mind. It really did. And it made me realize just how 
really evil Charlie was. Well, again, I'm so happy that um, you made the time to come back because what what I discovered in looking at the comments and the response and how many people were interested in, in watching our first video and our conversation was they really want to know your story and they want to hear it from you. So I'm going to take us back to some basic questions um, so that so that you can put things into context for people. Um, this may have been a long time ago, but in our country in the world, this was a major event that it's kind of like we can remember before this happened and then after this happened. So why don't we begin with what who were you before you met Charles Manson and before you joined the family? You know, you're 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 a person. You had a life before that. What was it like? Well, it depends on how far back we want to go. But, you know, my parents had really in the, this was all, yeah, a, a year before that, well, before I met Charlie, I met Charlie probably, I think it was in October, we, we had just been dropped out uh, for maybe two months. My Who were you dad, before that? Because you didn't, you didn't, you weren't born a hippie. In no. fact, the opposite. I, you know, you were, you liked school, you were, you know, you were a pretty normal so to speak kid but what happened during those years before that led to well, we, your family dropping out we we had lived in minnesota my dad was an artist um he his studio burnt down sent him into a depression he left us went to california he was there for about two years and then he kind of got his head back on and he wanted us his family back and so, and he had a good, good job with the general telephone company. And so my mom was thrilled to leave Minnesota. And so we moved to Santa Monica and I was 12, I think I was 12 then. And so I did seventh and eighth grade at the local junior high. Uh, I really didn't like California. <laughs> I, I really, <clears throat> when Christmas came around, I was very sad because I loved the snow and I didn't like all the palm, the tall palm trees on our street and I didn't like avocados. And we, you know, we talked about computers. The neighbor was a young couple and he worked for IBM. Wow. And he, right. And they were going to have a baby and they were kind of my saving grace. I love going over and visiting with them and talking with them. And um, he took me to his work. And we talked about computers, probably not as powerful as our phones are now, which took up a whole building. And, wow, you know, they had, to put in those, they had to put in those, those um, punched cards. I forget what they're called, but you know, the ones I think they're the called little... punch cards. <laughs> Could be. And and he showed me how they would, you know, put that in the machine and that would, you know, like do the programming or I, I can't remember exactly. All I know is that it was this huge building that composed this, you know, future, futuristic <laughs> computer, which was really mind blowing. So anyway, um, but then my dad and his artistic endeavors, um, they got, my parents got turned on to marijuana and then he got connected with uh, this underground newspaper and he was helping them do some of their art and, you know, like day glow posters and all of that. But anyway, that was the Oracle in LA and they, uh, some of them, they lost their lease. Some of them moved in with us and a couple of my dad and one of the other guys decided that they were going to follow Timothy Leary's advice, which was, you know, they were already turned on. Now they were tuning in to this alternative lifestyle and and then drop out, you know, and and my dad was really big on shirking materialism and keeping up with the Joneses and all of that. So they uh, decided to buy these bread trucks and turn them into campers and 
drop out. So that's what we did. That was the summer before high school. And um, anyway, so we just went down the road. The police moved us on to the next beach. At some point we met this, you know, we met this couple. They had a young, young child and, you know, I was pushing them on the swing and invited us to come over and live at their house and, you know, for the, for the summer. And um, I went to, I ended up going to Big Sur with my parents, met a guy, went to San Francisco with him because I always wanted to go to San Francisco. Then when I made my way back to LA to find my parents again, they were, they and this couple that I had, that we had met, they were all living at the hog farm. Now you, so that was kind of my experience, you know, in between that, that summer, the, the summer of, of 67. But an really. interesting thing happened that I'd like you to mention um, because it becomes key later. Your parents gave you permission to be on your own. How did that happen? Right. Well, when, when we were at this house, um, we took LSD and I felt, uh, I heard God, who I, felt was God and and maybe it was I don't I don't you know I don't know but I had this experience and I am on acid so telling me it was time for me to leave home I mean of just a simple statement you know which kind of blew me away but <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> I decided to run it by my parents you know, and they, you know, they wrote me a note. I had a note that said I was, you know, I was like an emancipated teenager to to live with this couple. But you were how old? Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Or was I fourteen? No, I was fourteen. I think you. <laughs> either way. Yeah. To be yeah, emancipated was 14. at fourteen, and it was really just a note. You didn't go to court. They didn't do anything no, no, official. It was, but it was nothing legal, <laughs> right? And and um, it, for fourteen years old to suddenly decide to go leave home, you had to feel more grown up than what I consider a typical fourteen year old. <laughs> Well, I think according to my parents, I think that they considered me to be more grown up. I was the firstborn. Uh huh. I'd always been I do it myself. Yeah, that's you know, my true. mom. My mom had to let go early on. I'd always been capable. I was a straight A student. Um, so I, you know, and I was independent. And at thirteen, okay, back back when we were still living in Santa Monica, but we had these hippies moved in and, you know, I went to the beach and, you know, I was introduced to sex. I had sex at 13. And so I think that was, you know, with older boys or young men, not, not like wantonly, but I had a couple of relationships <laughs> before that. And so I think that added to the maturity. Um, my dad was an intellectual. And so I was exposed to a higher level of <clears throat> parenting. I, I don't know. I don't, higher level is not going to go over well. It's not the right, right thing, but they treated me more like an adult than they did uh, their child. Which, so, as it turned out, may not have been a great thing. And as you state in the book, um, some of your earlier experiences were not really consensual. And and the right, I mean, right. we don't have to go into detail, but. Right. At that age, when you were starting to explore and being independent, you you had some influences, I think, that were not 
um, setting you on on a positive path necessarily? Well, my parents uh, <clears throat> were not the real uh, warm, fuzzy, huggy variety. Um, and I think that I, I remember wanting the affection. And so back then, wanting the affection would led to being taken advantage of, really. Yeah, I you... just wanted to make sure, you know, because as as we were unpacking a lot of your memories, and, and I don't know if people realize this, but when we wrote the book, you truly had not read a ton of books. You hadn't watched a lot of videos, uh, nothing. We really mined just what you remembered and your memories and your experiences and, and started to piece together how certain things unfolded that led you, um, you know, that led you to Manson. So right before, first of all, I'm sure people are curious, what did you find when you were in San Francisco before you went back to the hog farm? What did it look like? Well, it was, it was near Haight-Ashbury. Yeah, there was just lots of, you know, people in flowing clothes and flower, really the, the stereotype, flowers in their hair and, um, you know, smoking pot, um, playing guitar. Yeah, that was what was happening. Yeah. And then, and then. Tell us, how did you actually wind up with Charles Manson and the family? Because that's a very interesting twist of a story. Um, <clears throat> when I found my way back to Los Angeles, and that's a whole big story too. Yeah. But read the book and-, yeah. and, and we'll get, <laughs> No, it, it takes gets, a long time. It, it gets detailed. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't want, you know, people aren't going to listen to hours long uh, interview here. So, um, and and please excuse Deb and me. We both like to interrupt each other because we're anxious to tell the story. <laughs> but please uh, just, you know, know that this is very, um, a, a, a true conversation really. And I, I want Deb to keep the story moving. So when I, got back from San Francisco to Los Angeles looking for my parents. At that point, I didn't know they were at the hog farm, but I found them and this couple that we had met uh, on the beach, all living at the hog farm. And hog farm was on the top of a hill. Uh, the people in the community below did not like this commune at the top of the hill. They were preventing people from going up there. Uh, they And the people at the hog farm, of course, were afraid of being raided by the police for whatever reason. Lots of young musicians were coming up there. And I was a sexually active female. And so I was considered jailbait. And the leader of the commune, Wavy Gravy, and his wife talked to me. And I'm not sure that they talked to my parents about this first just came to me and made me feel like uh, I wasn't really welcome there. I wasn't, unless I slept in the attic of the house. And I, I didn't really want to do that. And since I'd been on my own, my parents weren't really like chaperoning me or, or keeping an eye, you know, they had let me, they gave me my independence and they were letting me be independent and, all the adults at the hog farm were kind of responsible for looking after all the children, like it takes a village, which Hillary Clinton coined, but it was that still was kind of the basis. And there weren't other kids my age. And even my brother, who was, you know, 12, and my sister, who was uh, like, nine it, 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 even the three of us were older than most of the kids were there were babies or toddlers so 
uh, anyway, I, I think that um, Hugh Romney and, and Bonnie Jean, I think they sent a couple of their friends up that lived somewhere else and they invited me to come and live with them. And it was through, so I did. And I was only there like a week maybe. And they suggested that I go with them to this uh, spiral staircase house, which I'd actually lived at previously with this couple from the beach. And they said, you know, we want you to meet this guy. And I don't think they even mentioned his name and his, and, and a group of girls. They and said, so they, they let, had met him. Forgive the interruption. But from what I remember, you want to meet someone groovy. Right. Yeah, that's what that's they, what they that's said what to they you. Said. You want to meet someone groovy. Right. So very, very 60s. We went down there and uh, I walked up the stairs and I think it was Lynette who greeted me and like... <gasps> Diane, you know, it was like, she knew my name. It was like, what? And Charlie, Diane is here. And so I just was immediately blown away, really. And Charlie got up from the circle, offered me a drink of his root beer. And uh, and and we weren't drinkers. They w really weren't drinkers. I mean, maybe some of the guys drank a beer or something, but I don't, re I don't remember ever really drinking a beer <laughs> in the group right so he offered me a drink of his root beer and ah so this is our diane and i was just like really it was kind of what you needed i felt real yes because here i had just been kind of rejected from where my parents were that commune right and and here i walk into this commune or yeah, at that point, I didn't really know it was a commune. It was a, you know, it was a party, but obviously Charlie was the leader and they just, I mean, literally totally embraced me. And it looked very magical. It felt but, very magical. And felt very magical. But what was the story behind how they knew your name in reality? Oh, apparently they had gone, The Charlie and the girls had gone up to the hog farm because, you know, one commune knew about other communes and and he probably wanted to join anyway. He was called Black Bus Charlie back then. And he, he'd gone up there several times. But on one of his visits, he met my parents and ended up taking a little sojourn out into the desert looking for gas tanks, which Charlie was always, he was obsessed with gas. And, uh, but I was in San Francisco at the time. He mentioned to my mom that they were gonna be going to San Francisco. And so she gave them my picture. And my picture is how they knew me because they did go to San Francisco and apparently they did look for me. So, and, and I think when you first met Charles Manson, we've talked about how it, it's like he could look at someone and know what they needed and be that for them. And did that happen for you when you first met him? Obviously it did because he made me feel very welcome. Uh, he felt, he made me feel very loved. And he, he made me feel like a woman as opposed to a child or a, you know, a young teenager, which I was. Yeah. But, um, so what were the early days like? You, you At this point, you now, uh, although again, we're skipping ahead. At this point, let's say you're with them. You've decided to be with them. You're going with them different places and you've become one of the girls so those early days were not like what it became later what was it like in those early days uh we we just we traveled around making music traveled around mostly to panga um when i actually we can uh back up just a hair and that is i went back and forth between charlie and the girls and the hog farm because i you know, I didn't immediately jump in. 
but then they were going to take a bus trip to New Mexico and Arizona. And I wanted, I didn't want to be left behind really was the bottom line. I didn't want to be left behind. So I believe it was in December. It was be just before Christmas. And, and so we hopped on the bus and, and we did that little trip. The bus broke down in Winslow, Arizona. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a song. I know. Yeah, I know. Uh, anyway, and it was cold. It was, you know, it was like we were freezing and it was snowing and we were waiting for the bus to be fixed. But anyway, um, so we ended up back in Topanga and we in Topanga, we lived in several different locations, abandoned houses or um, I, I, I don't know what the you know, behind the scenes. I know one of the houses that we lived in was like abandoned, but we lived in a couple of places in, in Topanga Canyon. And, um, and then we were decided we should move on, you know, probably the people that owned the houses or whatever kicked us out or, you know, we had to move on. And so we, we went up the coast and in the buses and the and we ended up in people have heard this before, but we were arrested. Mary Bruner had just had her baby relatively, you know, uh, shortly before that. And we were arrested for trespassing. And uh, I had a, at that point I had to pay fake ID and that, um, I don't know if it really helped or not because they suspected it was, fake and they took it away or they didn't give it back whatever anyway so we from there then I think we from there we found Spawn Ranch somebody introduced us to Spawn Ranch so we ended up at Spawn Ranch out in um, Simi Valley Chatsworth area so how did you all survive you know what did you eat what did you do um, and and how did Charles Manson orchestrate all of that? Well, he introduced us to dumpster diving. There was a lot, or somebody did. Uh, I remember it being Charlie. It's like, you know, get rid of your inhibitions. Just jump, jump in. And we uh, found amazing amount of good food that the grocery store, you know, I don't know if they had expiration dates then, but they, you know, they would just Probably, you know, it, it'd been on the shelf for a week. And so it was time to throw it out. A new batch came in, what whatever their process was. But we did find a, quite a bit of food uh, there. And uh, we made friends with the Helms Bakery Man. And he would come and bring us his day-old stuff that he didn't sell. So we had always had tons of that. And then people would come and, you know, that had money. And so we'd, you know, go to the store and, and buy groceries. But mostly it was you know, given to us or we got it out of the the dumpster. <laughs> what what is uh what does it mean to postulate? Uh Charlie would talk about postulating all the time. And that was uh basically positive thinking about something you needed or wanted. And would you get those things? Frequently we did. And so it made Charlie look like really magical now you know now that I'm older and more mature I'm thinking he that was probably a manipulation he already we needed something wanted something gas food clothing and he would manipulate somebody else into providing that and make it look like he like he was magical <laughs> I don't know. It it just uh, yeah. So there was a lot of magical, mystical, like a magical mystery tour, you know, in those early years, um, where it must have seemed really exciting. Right. Charlie was writing songs and singing songs. We took took LSD at Spawn Ranch. I loved going out for walks up into the hills. And I mean, but there was a lot, you know, a lot of time was spent feeding, clothing, and, you know, taking care of your personal business. Um, you know, we needed water. Spawn Ranch had a little creek that 
back then it seemed to me that it was running most of the time uh, so that we had water. And then, you know, there was the property, George Spawn's property had running, had running water. And so we, you know, there was a little restroom outhouse thing that, you know, we could take a shower, but you could also bathe in the creek. Um, and there, I remember there was a waterfall. So, but, you know, getting food, preparing food, you know, there were some children. So they, you know, they had needs. Um, but so at that price. point, yeah, at that point you were living in a commune, seemed fun. Everybody, uh, everybody was loving each other um, and loving Charlie or Charles May, I, I don't want to call him Charlie because I didn't know him personally. Um, but um, early on, he would do his speeches or his pontificating. Was there an indication early on about his increasing paranoia or his apocalyptic view? Because that became very important later. From from the very beginning, he would talk about um, this coming race war that and he'd learned about that in prison. So he do you think that he really believed it? Yes, I, I do. I mean, he at least what he conveyed to us, he was he was concerned. This is coming. This is real. This is happening. You know, he he heard it in the on the grapevine, you know, in the prison that this was something that, you know, the the black man would was called back then um, was was it was stirring. You know, this was this was something that was, you know, some uprising was going to happen. So he, he talked about that early, early like on the beginning. The, yeah, pretty much. So this wasn't something that happened like right before the crimes. Right. And it wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't a big emphasis. It was just, he was, you know, philosophizing and, you know, telling us what he'd learned in prison. So, so looking back, how do you think he really got everyone to follow him? Because I, I think to this day, people don't understand the process, um, you know, of how he was collecting followers and how he was gaining loyalty from the people who were with him. I think it was a whole mix of things. I mean, he had this uh, uncanny ability to read people um, and then, but he used it for his own survival or his own purposes at that point I'm not sure what the purpose was but I think primarily it was you know um his own survival and he when he came out of prison it was like the summer of love and you know he'd been tutored by pimps on you know uh, at the prison and that's what he wanted to do and I guess he tried to do that before but you know unsuccessful so um, when he came out, it was like, gosh, he, he hardly needed to in, in, employ any of those exercises because free love was the name of the game, really, you know. Uh, but I think that what he did learn was how to talk to people and especially women, uh, where he made each one of us feel like we were, we were it. We were his favorite. We were you know, very, very special. And he just had that ability to kind of capture you like that. And he was, he was kind of fun. A lot of the time he was fun and kind of impish. And, you know, he had this curly hair and, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he was a small man. So he, he didn't have this huge um, physical presence, you know, or a big booming voice or anything, but he was just, subtle and I think he'd learned um how to fill in the gaps I mean if we you know a lot of us 
All of us girls were broken somehow. We'd been kicked out, uh, disenfranchised, um, you know, maybe even abused. And he was able to fill in the blanks. And he was a very gentle and loving lover. And he would, he didn't, I, I didn't feel taken advantage of, you know, I mean, there was, yeah, there was a couple of times, but for the most part, it was like he taught us to do this give and take. And so that along with the music and the postulating and all of that, and then he also wove in, you know, philosophical, biblical principles, Scientology, you know, all of that mystical stuff that he just bits and pieces, but to the naive, it, you know, it just made sense. And then we weren't in competition. The women weren't in competition with each other for his, for his attention that I was really aware of. Maybe, maybe we were on a certain level, but he taught us or trained us to not be that way you know that to to share you know and and the different orgies you know love-ins that we we had were were all part of that training is you know that we didn't like couple off it wasn't just those two over there or those two over there and it wasn't just male and female it was you know female and female male you know it I think he covered it all. And, but he still became the central orchestrator. Like he definitely. was, right? Yes, de yeah, definitely he was because he was the one that, you know, pushed or nudged or what, or suggested, commanded. I mean, it was all of those things. Like a puppet master. Kind, yes. Yeah, in a way. So when when did you notice things start to change or become more uh, where he became more paranoid or uh, things became a little more stressful? And did you ever talk to any of the other women about anything you observed that was changing? Or was it sort of like you didn't talk to each other about Charlie. Again, I said it about Manson. Um, Why, do you need me to break that question up? No, that's okay. Um, we, we were at Spawn Ranch and then we were introduced to Death Valley, right? And we went up there. But before that, I mean, when Tex joined the family, and it, it just started getting bigger and dune buggies started coming into the picture, you know, maybe with one or whatever and, and outposts. But there was an incident at some point in that when we were at, at the ranch, I think that like some Charlie wanted more money. And so we tried to do a like a nightclub in the saloon but I think also, you know, Tex and maybe some other factions were doing some drug deals and maybe, you know, and some went bad. I think that's what happened with ended up happening to Hinman was a result of a bad drug deal. Gary Hinman being the man that was murdered by Bobby Beausoleil. Right. But there is so Charlie much to unpack. Oh, about these yeah. two, was it three years, two years leading up to the crimes? So much to unpack. So many so things much. that unfolded and twists and turns. I mean, we haven't even talked about um, Manson and um, and Dennis Wilson. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because well, did, I, did, I answer the, did I answer the last question? I don't know. We'll go back. Well, well, I mean, yeah, let's go back to that because um, just he did change. I mean, at, at some point he had topographical maps and he, he was looking for a, an un, uh, not necessarily unmarked, but a way to get from Spawn Ranch 
to Death Valley, to the Barker Ranch, without, you know, going on like major highways, you know, so that's what he wanted to do. And I ended up getting left there, not accidentally, but I was tasked with staying at Barker Ranch. And then Bobby was looking for uh, a, a way back. And this, so this was before the, the whole Hinman thing happened, but, you know, things were starting to escalate. And when I went, I, so I went with Bobby and instead of going to Spawn Ranch, we were at Gresham Street, which would we, it was nicknamed the Yellow Submarine House, which I knew nothing about until we'd landed there. Um, and things, that's when I noticed the big change because now the straight Satan uh, motorcycle group is is on kind of on board and there's knives and there's guns and they're actually stealing beetles of you know Volkswagen beetle bugs and turning them into dune buggies and so it was it was really frenetic and Charlie was absolutely furious with me what the are you doing here I told you to stay in the desert and so that's when I really saw the change. And then the White Album came out or had been out. And that's when I was first introduced to the White Album. Although people have said, no, it was before that, but that's what I remember. I don't, you know, I don't remember hearing the White Album before that, but Charlie played it forwards and backwards and slow. And and he was sure that the Beatles were, were confirming his, supposition about this race war and so then it became that's how helter skelter came on the scene was through the white album that the beatles had produced and charlie was sure that they were talking to him and from your observation he really did seem to believe it he was delusional he wasn't making it up he really felt that the beatles were talking to him which is for someone who's in a delusion, they can start to think that everything is connected. So at that point, but I think we're missing part of the story. When, in relationship to Gresham, when did you go to Dennis Wilson's house? Was that before? Yes. So prior to Gresham Street, when things really started to escalate, where Manson was wanting more money and he's trying to raise money and he's becoming more paranoid, he had a recording session with Dennis Wilson and you actually went, lived there at Dennis Wilson's house. What, what was that like? Oh, well, that was part of the Magical Mystery Tour for sure is um you know dennis had picked up a couple of girl a couple of the, the girls in the family and uh hitchhiking to spawn ranch and so that's he met charlie and they 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 kind of instantly bonded really um through music and i remember dennis took me and i think ruth and no no I, was ruth on the scene i don't remember me, but it was me, I think Nancy Pittman and somebody else took us to the Colorado River. You know, it, he was going to like some kind of a family <laughs> get get together. I think it was probably Memorial Day at that point. So um, that was really fun. You know, we slept on the beach. We slept in a hotel and we went in his Rolls Royce. <laughs> so that was really, you know, fun. And the family was kind of like, Meh, they're not sure they really were accepting you mean Dennis uh, Wilson's right. family. Dennis Wilson's family, right. But by the end of the trip, yeah, no, we, you know, they shared their food, you know, barbecue when we rode in their boats and, you know, anyway. So, yeah, that was, so that was all part of the. So that was a high point. That was definitely a high point. Yeah. I, I loved his house. His house was just the house and the grounds. It was a uh, old Will, um, Will Rogers estate and it was just you know big logs and huge fireplace and a guest house and a pool and it was just in a big I remember like redwood trees and there was a swing and 
you know, expansive lawn. It was just a beautiful place. And, and Dennis had lots of musicians that would come over and he proudly introduced Charlie to them, you know, at least in, in the beginning. And, um, you know, they, Charlie was teaching Dennis how to play the guitar. Which some people might find strange, but Dennis Wilson was a drummer. He, he wasn't was a, a guitarist. So. Right. He was a drummer and a surfer. He was apparently the only real surfer in the group. In, in the group. And uh, Manson had a recording. You were present for a recording session that he had with Dennis Wilson where it didn't go so well, but it wasn't because of them, was it? It was more because of him. Do you remember? Yes, I mean, I was, I, I was, we went to, we went to Brian's house, mm -hmm. you know, kind of up the street from Dennis's um, off of Sunset. And I was swimming in the pool and he was in the recording, Charlie was in the recording studio. And um, next thing I know is Charlie's at the pool, you know, girls get out, get dressed, get out, we're leaving. And we kind of like tore out of there. And it wasn't until later, I mean, that I realized that there'd been a confrontation. And really, I, I'm not sure what it was, but it was that Charlie did not want to do what they wanted him to do. He, he, he needed total autonomy. He, you know, whether it was the chords that they were playing, wh what they wanted him to wear, you know, what the words that he wanted to sing. I mean, it was all of those things he would not, you know, um, bend to their, uh, what they wanted to do with him. And I think that they were looking for some musical talent. And I think that they did realize that Charlie had some talent, but he wasn't willing to be molded into what they wanted. And so, and I don't, I don't know that, I think I've heard various other accounts of what happened there, but personally, I don't have that. I don't have the, that first person knowledge. But um, yeah, it it caused it definitely caused a rift, and that it, that's the basis really for my um, comments about people thinking Charlie wanted to be a rock star. Well, I think he did, but he wasn't willing to. If he really wanted to do that, I I think he would have stuck a carrot up his nose or. <laughs> you know, shaved his head or whatever, right? If that really he was, was into his, his, yeah, he was very into his specific message, his specific yes. philosophy, which supports the idea that he was really losing his mind. He was believing that he was man's um, son. Yes, which he used to reiterate all the time. And he had had you know, some kind of crucifixion experience, I think in San Francisco on LSD. And so, you know, and he would reenact that for us uh, periodically, you know, for a group of people on on acid. And and really he could, he could make you think that you could see the, you know, the stigmata, the, the holes wow. in his hands, but you're on, I mean, it, that's the power of suggestion on LSD. <laughs> Wow. So, yeah. so there's so many details. That's why people have been studying this for so many years. And, you know, it's really a blessing that, that you were there. And also you're not a person who will make an assumption about something that you didn't have firsthand knowledge about. Um, but looking back, um, Right leading up to August 8th and 9th of, um, you know, of 1969, those were the two days of, of the murders. Um, and again, we're skipping a lot of details and, and a lot of things that uh, you experienced up until then. But right before then, did you notice anything that led you to believe 
that something like that could happen or was going to happen? No, I, I didn't, but I was also kind of on the outside now because I didn't obey Charlie in staying in the desert. And so I was, you know, kind of a hanger on her, I guess. I was still part of the family, but, you know, I wasn't part of the inner circle, but the girls, you know, were going out on these creepy crawling missions where they would dress in black and they go to people's houses. And as far as I know or knew, they weren't stealing things. Charlie had just tasked them with sneaking in and out of people's houses, having eating some food, rearranging the furniture, just to mess with people's minds, you know, and maybe, you know, hindsight, maybe that was part of a, a preparation for, I don't know, for preparing against the race war or, you know, or, or just playing, he loved to play mind games with people, um, with us, with other people. And so he was definitely, you know, he was definitely preparing them for something and I was never asked to do it. But you weren't exactly someone who listened to him very much. Didn't you right. didn't you find out later from someone who was there that you used to just like get up and walk around and roll your eyes? And so I don't think he would have trusted you. Thank goodness. Yes. I think. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for making me who I am. I, <laughs> making you a, a what is what do they call it? Um, uh, something defiant. <laughs> You were always defiant um, and not one that was, you know, uh, going to follow blindly, especially things that were against your nature. So really, things were heating up. You saw more people there. You saw more, you know, more uh, dune buggies. But at that point, you didn't even know that anything had happened to Gary Hinman. Um, nothing. You were just taking care of the babies and things like that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, cleaning. I don't know. I just I like things clean. I still like things clean and organized. And, you know, so there's always a need for that. <laughs> yeah. So you kept busy. And um, although didn't you receive some training combat training if oh we we did i was part of a group a little uh knife lesson uh that charlie gave he gave us uh, at some point uh everybody had a buck knife you know maybe a six inch buck knife of some variety and he always had one on him which i think he he really had had one on most of when I knew him but but that was back then that was very common for men carried some kind of a a, a knife you know to peel an apple or whatever so, I mean, I mean, but yeah, these I mean, but these buck knives they did not look like they looked look like you could a, kill a bear I don't think we could kill a bear. But anyway, he gave this little lesson about the most effective way to 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 stab somebody with a knife and 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 kill them. And he said, you know, and and because he loved to play these mind games, I'm thinking that and I think he even said it is that you've got to you've got to be willing to kill in order to not be killed. Well, that kind of makes sense. Right, well, 14, I mean, fifteen-year-old mind. If there's a war going on, you know, or some kind of a battle, if you don't want to be killed and you have a weapon, you know, you you need to know how to use it in order to not be killed yourself. So that kind of made sense to me. It's not something that you know most of, uh, you know, hippie dumb would have embraced at all, but. But anyway, there were more guns and knives around, and I think I hid my buck knife like under the mattress or something. I I didn't want to carry a buck knife. 
<laughs> it doesn't seem to suit your personality from what I'm from what I know. Do you I always say you were a flower child in a garden of weeds, you know, when you were back there. Um there's well that's so, what I, so I love to I love to do that. I mean in yeah a, a, everywhere I went, you know, I was just a, a wanderer, you know, check out the caves, the flat the wildflowers. I went on a fast where I ate. I only had honey and lemon, lemon water. So I, you were you were kind of a genuine hippie. Um, <laughs> you know, there's still so much to cover. I just don't think we can cover it in this um, in this video. I hope people will subscribe and will, you know, send us questions. Uh, put the I put the address in. I'll put it in the description if there's more they want to know. But I guess uh, to finish today's discussion, um, you know, there's a reason why you did not want to respond to Leslie Van Houten's release. Now, I know this people are wondering, um, you talked a little bit about that in the beginning, but um, in the last video we did, I, I read a passage from the book and you hadn't looked at it in many years and you had a very visceral, emotional reaction, um, you know, the, that made you cry and was making me cry. So you knew her back then. And what was your memory? Uh, you didn't know. So now you were whisked off uh, after the crimes. Um, you were whisked off to, to Barker Ranch. So let's talk about that briefly and how you found out what actually had happened in your words. Right, well, um, yeah, I had, didn't know what had happened. You know, I had woke up to Leslie burning stuff which turned out to be from the La Biancas. and you know a car came down the road she said don't let them see me she yeah they just gave me a ride from Griffith Park and so I um was the next thing I know I'm, I'm being whisked off to Olancha which was kind of like the gateway to to Death Valley to where it was often a meeting place where we would take off together because it takes a lot of people to get the vehicles up Golar Wash. And anyway, um, so it, it was there that Tex uh, showed me the newspaper with the headlines about the La Bianca Tate murders. And he slapped the paper and he said, I did this, Charlie told me to. And I was just it's like, you know, my whole world, the rug of my world had been pulled out from under me. I just could not, you know, believe that that it had gone to this, what? To, to this point where they, Charlie had asked people to murder for him? It just was inconceivable. And now I, I'm afraid to leave. It's like, oh my gosh, if they could kill kill people I could be killed I, I you know and now that I, I I know this truth so it was it was really scary and then we went up to the desert and that's when the girls started telling me their participation and and re your reading of that passage just really brought it home I, I remembered then so vividly being there at Willow Springs and the girls telling me kind of gleefully w w their participation and I just could not believe that they had done that that didn't seem like there was any horror or remorse or regret that they had done that you know it was ah it was it was really it really was painful and and I still I still could cry just, you know, these were people that I loved. These were people that I had actually physically loved and mentally loved and emotionally loved. And yes, it wasn't quite this, as mystical, magical and beautiful as it was in the beginning, but I had, had still been holding on to that truth. 
right? That's That was still why I stayed there is because I wanted to feel that love again. And so anyway, I just was totally blown away at that truth. And then the rereading and now her, her getting out and, and people can read the comments and understand the controversy of, of, you know, now what, you know, now what for her and, and, and people's reaction and even my own reaction is, um, uh, conflicted, you know, I, I, I am conflicted. So I, I don't want to make a, a, a response other than that. Yes, it's extremely controversial. It's, it, it's painful. It's, it's painful no matter how you look at it. It was an extremely painful event. And so that's my comment. It, it is extremely painful and people have to search their own souls and 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 be you know comfortable or accepting of how they feel and i i totally understand both sides well diane there's so much again to your experience your story um and you so bravely share it in your book um i'm sure that we could talk again um you know i so thank you for your words and understand fully um that this is this changed it's an event that changed the world um and even though it, it's so many years ago um i'm sure it feels like yesterday you know your life it, it, it's something that changed your life forever um, so I appreciate that that you're willing to talk about it. And um, cults still happen today, and uh, and there are other cults that have had tragic results. So um, talking about it's an important thing. We need to bring these things out in the open. Anything you'd like to say before we close? Yes. You know, thank you for your guidance, Deb. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's hard to, you know, and and we always interrupt each other. I mean, or talk over each other. So, you know. Finish each other's it. sentences, like right now. <laughs> yeah, always. And so it's just the way we, you know, we do, we, we, we have coined the term collaboration. <laughs> Instead of collaboration, it was a collaboration. It really so, was. So. Yeah. Anyway, I, 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 I'm blessed to have Deb in my life, you know, to be the, the co-author of my story and uh, the people that we've met along the way. I've, I've got to, you know, uh, say thank you to Ken Maines. Ah. He was, it, if anybody goes to his station or his channel, whatever it's called, because we're both really new to this whole you know, online YouTube podcast thing, you know, um, but I really appreciated the comments that, that he made. And he even said he interviewed me and he interrupted me all the time. And it's, you know, it's <laughs> anyway. It's so, so that's easy all... to do because there's so much. There there's is so much. much. There and, is. And, and this is probably, you know, gone way too long. It'll be amazing if people listen to the end, but <laughs> Well, I, if I'm you amazed. do, then yeah. you are special, and we thank you, and uh, we'll see you again. This is uh, okay. Deborah Herman and and uh, Diane saying, until next time. Until next time. <laughs>